So hello everybody. Today, uh, by popular request, I am extremely happy to be welcoming uh, the wonderful Alana Fairchild, who is the creator of these beautiful crystal mandala oracle cards, which many of you have seen me using again and again uh, on my daily Facebook messages. And so Alana, welcome. Welcome to the, the daily message. Thank you. Uh, you are now the daily message. <laughs> um, can I by asking you something? Where did these cards come from? Because I found these through a, a friend in, in Malta, on the island of Malta. She had a deck. And I kind of used them once and then ran to my phone and ordered them on Amazon, like within like 20 <laughs> seconds. And they're so beautiful. Tell us about this beautiful deck. Is it, is it your flagship thing that you have at the moment? Tell us. Uh, thank you for that. It's really beautiful. Every deck has a story and that one was actually pretty random. I, um, I was writing an online training course, the first one I'd ever done. And I had in my heart that I wanted to write that deck, but I hadn't done it yet. I was going to do it like a year later. And then in the middle of the night, spiritual guidance kind of half woke me up out of a dream and said, you need to write that deck and it needs to be done in, for this online training. And I said, because, you know, you're half asleep. You go, oh, okay. So I said, okay, I'll do that. And then the next morning I woke up and I realised the online training started in like two months. And I thought, I don't even know if that's possible. So I messaged my publisher and I said, look, I've had this dream, you know, they're very open to all that. So I've had this dream and spiritual guidance said that they want this deck done by a certain time can you help me? And they kind of, you know, went back through how long it would take to print and do the design and get, you know, the distribution. And they figured out that I would have um, two weeks to write it. And, oh <laughs> and I, I said, yeah, it was insane. I, it's, but I did it. And, and I, it actually took less. It took like 10 days, but I was channeling it and I couldn't even feel it in my body. I was just literally, it's the only one I've written like this. And I was just typing, kind of saying the words and typing as it came through. But it was so intense. I, would, like, I couldn't walk properly for 10 days because I was so up here. Like I was tripping over things. I must have looked like I was constantly drunk. And <laughs> my editor said to me, I don't know what you did differently with this deck, but it was so easy to edit. There were hardly any errors at all and can you read that and I'm like no <laughs> I just it's too hard on the physical body I can't do that again but it was very amazing. special to yeah that that's through. amazing yeah actually my book Moonology which is um a book that uh is kind of like the backbone of a lot of what I do I wrote that in about six weeks beautiful ah <laughs> it was meant to come through yeah and it was a similar thing i did a workshop i all about the moon which i've been teaching about the moon for years and i've never done a workshop went home wrote to hey my publishers hey house and said hey listen if you ever want a book about the moon i know i've got a book due in february or in may or whatever it was but if you ever want one about the moon yeah. they're like yes we want it we want it now can you do it in six weeks i was like oh my god and then done funny That's what funny. it happened isn't it's it? so, yeah it's just when it's in alignment and it's sort of yeah, it's getting out of that headspace, and thinking it can't happen, and just letting yeah. it come through. It's quite a ride, though. So, what advice would you give to anyone out there? Because there are more and more people out there doing this, uh, including me. I'm creating a new set of uh, oracle cards right now. What advice would you give to people about writing oracle cards? I know for myself, I really make a choice to surrender into the creative process because it's always different for me for each deck so surrender into the process and let it be unique because for me it's never the same writing something creating something new it's always different and don't expect it to be the same and i think that gives you the freedom to just go with the energy of what's coming through and it gives you an opportunity to kind of discover what your voice is in that expression um, and if you're in that process then you you really are 
allowing for that creativity and not trying to control it. Because the moment we try to direct it or put expectations on it, I find it tends to shut it down. So just being in that state of conscious surrender and allowing really enables something quite unique to come through, I feel. And so when you say you surrender, like for me, that might mean going out into the garden and chanting and doing a fire yagam. What's your process of surrendering to the creative process? It's similar in a way. I do a lot of laying in the sun when I can. I feel that there's so much creative energy that comes from the sun, which I really love. It's just trusting if I need to rest, I rest. If I really feel, you know, sometimes I get agitated and it's like, oh, I have to write. And it's just this kind of, needing to get something out. So I, I put time aside and I really prioritise it. And I just, surrender for me is about tuning in almost like a surfer and, and feeling the currents for when I need to write, when I need to rest, when I need to step back and step away. If something's not flowing, just step away. And then either in meditation or I'll have a dream or, you know, I'm in the shower or cleaning the house and suddenly, you know, the idea is there. It's like, oh, that's the piece that was missing. So it's quite organic. It requires a lot of trust. It's kind of, I find, like a dance. And, but there's always this beautiful order, but it's not from my brain. My brain's just motley and all over the <laughs> many, you know, tangents and connections. But I think spirit has an idea of what, yes. what it wants to express. Yeah. yeah. And... Um... So I would like to talk to you about this card, which keeps popping out. Oh, she's come up so much recently. I've been getting so many messages about Manaji. Right. Now, I have never read something which basically says you've had too much spiritual fire. And it's come up for me when I've been, for example, when I started doing the chanting I'm doing every day online and absolutely loving but I was doing it seven days a week and I was starting to feel quite, oh, yeah. And so I thought, you know what, maybe I should, I don't know, take the weekends off and just hang out on the weekends. And I got this card twice in one week. Once when I did a personal reading for myself or once when I did it online. So I thought, okay, I'll take the advice. But tell us about this card and, and, and how it relates to lockdown as well. Because now I think of it, it's actually kind of a lockdown card as well, isn't it? It's like everybody gets a chance to, well, the lucky people get a chance to stay home. Yeah, I, um, I really resonate with that. And I do think it's a lockdown card in a way. Marduchi is amazing. The, the story about her is that she actually dwells in complete awareness, deep, deep, deep in the earth and just radiates light. I mean, it's such a beautiful image. If I'm ever kind of overloaded, because spiritual energy can be quite uh, vata, like quite stimulating and if you have a lot of it you can feel almost like you've got you know too much electricity running through your circuits it can be yeah. hard to to settle the nervous system really feels it so a little bit is good and you know like lifting weights you want enough that you cause some change but not so much that you injure yourself so right. biology normally comes up when there's a risk of kind of like a spiritual burnout and we need to just kind of settle and and have that compassionate love and respect for the body where we recognize sometimes netflix is a good spiritual antidote it's not <laughs> you know maybe all the time but we yeah. need to balance and we need to give our humanity time to integrate because the spirit's always on it's like technology it just yeah. goes constantly yeah. it doesn't need recharging it, it, we can't live in that without some sense of progressing if we try to kind of do it all at once, it's like never exercising and then running a marathon, you know, things are yeah. going to hurt. <laughs> yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So um, tell me now, Alana, am I right? I think your um, lovely assistant, Diana, I think I was told that you are, a, you were trained in law. Did you actually get a law degree or you, what's the story there? Yeah, that was an interesting time. <laughs> In my, I got a law degree and depression. Yay! <laughs> wow. That, yeah, that wasn't really good for, for me personally. I mean, I think looking back, it was beneficial because as you can probably hear when I speak, I'm all over the map. So I think law 
kind of taught me how to zone in and follow a thread. So it was useful, but in terms of a career path, it, it really wasn't good for me. It, it pushed me more than anything to explore and try and find something more bohemian. You know, no one told me when I was younger, oh, you can be a singing, dancing, hippie, spiritual teacher for a career. You know, everyone said, oh, you're good at English. You should, you know, do journalism or law. That was about the extent of the imagination. And, you know, that will work for some people. Obviously, it's a suitable career, but it wasn't for me. Didn't so, at all, so what was the process then did you actually ever did you do the bar thing after the degree did you actually become a lawyer and how on earth did you then become you so i um i got a couple of job offers one with um a really prestigious law firm and the other with a small family law firm and i considered both of them and i just felt bleak <laughs> and I thought I can't do this so I decided in all of my wisdom to not accept either of them and I took random jobs I worked in retail for a little while and I tell you that has got to be one of the hardest jobs on the planet people yeah. treat yeah you like rubbish I mean it was amazing <laughs> but I learned a lot and it gave me some breathing space to figure out, you know, what I was going to do because I didn't have a clear plan. I just knew that's not right. Um, and then around that time, I graduated and I decided not to do, um, I was like this to you, the bar or anything like that. And I went to see this woman who ended up being my first spiritual teacher. She taught me how to meditate and psychic development classes. I worked with her for almost two years. And... I Can went for her, her um, sorry? Can you tell us her name? Yes, Kazi. Yeah, she was lovely. I don't think she teaches anymore, but um, okay. I don't know. But, but she was great. And, and in Sydney, yeah? Yes, in Sydney, yeah. And, and she just said to me, you should do what I do. And I thought that's the most sensible thing I've heard in <laughs> years. And... And so I did, I just studied with her and she was great. She was very encouraging and she organised my first uh, spiritual reading festival. So I sat down, at, you know, to do a tarot reading for someone and had my moment where I thought, oh my God, what if someone sits down and no words come out? And I freaked out and I sat down and I had a vision pop into my head and I just started and that was it really. She said to me, oh, it'll take you 10 readings and then you'll be fine, but it didn't take that long. And then it was just because it was what I was meant to do. And so readings developed into yeah. teaching and then that developed into writing and it's all kind of organic. So sort of stumbled okay. into it very inelegantly. <laughs> very elegantly, I would say. Okay, oh. so tell us about, uh, there's, I'd like to talk to you about two actual things that you're doing right now because they're both actually really important to me um two of my favorite goddesses you're doing something with kuan yin the kuan yin transmissions and you're doing kali oracle cards so i'm all ears can you please tell us about those they're actually connected uh the kuan yin transmission is it's a book it's a meditation and music cd it's a set of cards and it's an online training program that launches in july and it's about connecting with, I call her the cosmic Madonna, which is essentially five facets of the divine feminine. So it's Kuan Yin, Mother Mary, Goddess Isis, Tara and Kali Ma. And to me, they are all facets of this one divine being. So that particular program is about learning how to connect and channel those divine energies for yourself as a spiritual practice and as healing, if you want to do that. And the Kali Oracle... I've been wanting to write that for years and the artist who's working on it, um, he's amazing. He actually did the art for the Isis Oracle and we're at Jimmy Manchin and we asked him originally some years ago if he would do it and he just said no and I thought, oh, that's a bit, you know, but it must not be time. And then some years later, my publisher said, oh, let's just go back and ask him again. So we did. And he just goes, yeah, okay. And I just thought, oh, how exciting. And little did I realise that <laughs> the reason I think that, you know, I, I just wouldn't have been ready a few years ago, it was full on to write. Because you go into the realm, don't you, of what yeah. you're working with. So I, 
had an intensive, you know, I call it my Carly University, where I was just in her, my life has just been completely transformed. So <laughs> relationships ended and things happened and new stuff being born, but she's so amazing and so fiercely compassionate. I just love her to bits. Um, and I know some people are scared of her, but I, I think she has just so much tenderness and so much beauty and so much love for the soul. So we've I'm very excited. Been, she's been out. We've oh, been doing a Kali, a Kali mantra. I've been chanting that every day. It must be nearly 50 days now. And uh, oh yeah, it's been extremely powerful and it's been very interesting. Um, <clears throat> the initial resistance I had to doing the chant um, because it, I think the Kali energy was quite uh confronting and and i've settled into it and i think that's been the experience for a lot of the people who've been doing the chanting with me so carly is she's making herself known i think we need her to me she's really she is the kind of goddess of transition and rebirth i feel and, and we're at such a time yeah. with COVID and and just the amount of i mean she rules the base chakra as well the amount of base chakra clearing around fear financial issues, um, trust and belonging and feeling safe at a spiritual level in a human body at the moment is such an issue for so many people. I just yeah. think we need her. Yeah. 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 But wow. So, yeah, no, it's, it's amazing. So, okay, last question. Why do you think that humans need the divine feminine now? Because I strongly believe that we need the divine feminine now. So why do you think that is? I think we always need her, but I think it's particularly at this time because there is this kind of dissociation that's happened where we're going through a phase as a species where we're really developing the intellect and we've perhaps got a little bit overly enthusiastic about that and lost connection to the intuitive wisdom, which is not limited by logic or what appears to be rational or linear, and yet has this ability to help us connect with who we truly are and through that what it is that we're here to do like you can't analyze your way into that kind of knowledge it, it can only really come through internal inner connection and trusting and kind of growing into it and i i hear i'm, I'm sure you hear this too so many people are really trying to find that sense of meaning and they want to know what's my purpose what am I here to do? You know, how do I find that deep meaning? And we can only find it through that connection to the spiritual intelligence within, which is, in my view, the divine feminine, whether you're in a male or a female body. It's the wisdom of the heart that isn't disconnected, but is actually an organic expression of what our soul is. So that's why I think we need her. We need her to find the way. We need her to be true to who we are, and what we're here to do and we need her to be able to outgrow the issues and the problems that we struggle with and grow into the truth and the fulfillment of our our destiny our sacred soul path and, and do you think it's something for everybody or is it just for us women no it's it's for humans it's for humans you know i i don't even the sacred masculine energy which i think will also have its turn when we're ready to deal with that. I think we need to deal with that too. But first things first, you know, it, none of that can actually happen until we connect with the heart space and really awaken the divine feminine more extensively and more globally. And then from that, there can be healing in other ways. But it, masculinity and femininity and healing that, it's not a gender issue or a biology issue. It's a human issue it's for all of us. Divine feminine is about the heart. And yeah and so for all the mothers of sons out there what would you suggest oh well how exciting i mean you're in a kind of opportunity in this world age where you have exposure to teachings and guidance and empowerment as a woman that we've never really experienced before and you're helping to raise a future generation of men and i think you know, we have the opportunity to 
share with young people, male and female, the value of the feminine, but also as that starts to heal, the value and the necessity of a conscious masculine, you know, that can have discernment and can have courage and can really, in a conscious way, stand up for what has meaning. You know, we need that. It's important, actually. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So, okay, I said I was, there's only one more question, but just two more, actually. Okay. If you had to read okay. one of your books or cards or whatever, what would you recommend people start with you? And then I'm going to ask you, which book of all the books you've read that are not by you would you recommend? Um, I think people ask me this a lot with my work, like what should I start with? And there's not one thing. I, I always say start with the thing that you feel drawn to because everyone is going to kind of jump in at a different place. And I think... It's, this is random, but I remember reading this study about how cows know which grass to eat. And it's like, it doesn't look any different, but they always naturally gravitate towards the more nutritious grass. They just know. The scientists are like, how does that happen? But I think there is this kind of innate soul instinct. If we listen to the heart, that just naturally attracts us towards what it is that's going to nourish us. So in terms of what book or what deck or what CD, it's what the heart draws you towards. Um, and in terms of other writers, I love Marion Woodman. Have you come across her? She's um, no. she was a, a Canadian psychotherapist. Just, she writes about the feminine and oh, she's marvelous. She's a lot, she, she wrote quite a bit. Um, there's one book called Addicted to Perfection and another called, I think it's just called The Conscious Feminine. But any of her work is amazing. And she has some right. audio as well. Yeah. All right. I will do that. All right. Well, Alana, thank you so much for coming on here today. It's amazing to uh, connect with you. Thank you for the beautiful cards, which we all love. And uh, oh, it's my pleasure. And uh, I hope that we get to meet in person one day. I would love that. I just sense there'll be a lot of tea and a lot of, like, snort laughter. <laughs>